school, my love, my truest, let it sail on silver wings. Life's a twinkling, that's for certain, but it's such a fine thing. There's a gathering of spirits, there's a festival of friends, and we'll take up where we left off when we all meet again. I can't explain it I couldn't if I tried How the only things we carry are The things we hold inside Like a day in the open Like the love we won't forget Like the laughter that we started And it hasn't died down yet So let it go, my love, my truest Let it sail on silver wings Life's a twinkling, that's for certain But it's such a fine thing There's a gathering of spirits There's a festival of friends And we'll take up where we left off when we all meet again Oh yeah, now didn't we? And don't we make it shine? Aren't we standing in the center of Something rare and fine Some glow like embers Like light through colored glass some give it all in one great flame Throwing kisses as they pass So let it go, my love Sail on silver wings Life's a twinkling, that's for certain But it's such a fine thing There's a gathering of spirits There's a festival of friends And we'll take up where we left off when we all meet again Just east of Eden But there's heaven in our midst And we're never really all that far From those we love and miss Wait out in the water There's a glory all around and the wisest say there's a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. So let it go, my love, my truest. Let it sail on silver wings. Life's a twinkling, that's for certain. But it's such a smiling thing. There's a gathering of spirits. There's a festival of friends. And we'll take up where we left off when we all meet again. Let it go, my love, my truest. Let it sail on silver wings. Life's a twinkling, that's for certain. But it's such a fine thing. There's a gathering of spirits. There's a festival of friends. And we'll take up when we met. When we all meet again Let it go, my love, my truest Let it sail Life's a twinkling, that's for certain But it's such a fine thing There's a gathering of spirits Festival of friends And we'll take up where we left off
friends, family, colleagues, members, welcome to the church of Benjamin Franklin and Samuel Adams, of Neesima Joe and Phyllis Wheatley, and welcome to the church of the shoes of Evan and Anna Marie, Nate and Amanda, Melanie and Noah. For in this house, the veil between heaven and earth, the living and the dead, is thin. Here in God's house, the saints in heaven and the saints on earth are one. Welcome to this sacred space and this sacred time as we gather together to handle the awesome mysteries of life and death, love and loss, time and eternity, spirit and flesh. Welcome to you who are stunned, who cannot imagine the world, this world, without this special man. Welcome to you whose grief is deep and raw. Welcome to you who knew and loved and respected and admired Evan Shu. This afternoon, we gather in this space to give God thanksgiving for this man, this amazing, creative, brilliant, exuberant human being. And we also come to say goodbye, to send him home into the arms of the God in whom he deeply believed, the God whom he served creatively with dedication and imagination and heart. And I call your attention to who is gathered in this space this afternoon, representing all kinds of facets of Evan's life. Anna Marie called him a Renaissance man whose life and interests bridged so many worlds and you represent those worlds. This church, Old South Church, is but one of many of the worlds Evan inhabited, but oh, did he inhabit this one. Speaking on behalf of Old South Church in Boston, Evan Shu was a gift, a delight, a co-worker and problem solver, a bridge builder, a consummate communicator, a singer, an actor and reader. He was for many of us both leader and friend. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit and join with me responsively in the prayer of invocation as printed in the program. God of the morning and of the evening, God of our living and of our dying, God of Seattle and Boston, of theater and song, of architecture and data CAD, of iPad and computer, of jazz and of gospel, God of Evan. Touch and bless this time, these people, this gathering. Touch and bless our memories and our grief, our tears and our laughter, our loving and our losing with your soft and lovely presence. Let your love for Evan be now as a seal upon his heart, as a mantle about his shoulders, and as a crown upon his head. Bless us and encourage us as we say together, Well done, Evan, you good and faithful servant. Amen and amen. The hymn, God, Creation's Great Designer, Architect, and Artisan, is found in the insert.
You may be seated. You know, when you perform at the, uh, the comedy studio in Cambridge, Rick Jenkins, who's the big manager there, will tell you that the absolute worst thing you can do on stage is bring notes up with you. But you know, he's not here today, so I have mine, you know? Yeah. Did you know? Should have numbered them, they're out of order. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Uh, my name's Nate. Uh, Evan was my dad, but uh, most of you probably already know that by now, or some of you are thinking, that's what Nate looks like now. I know, it's a bit confusing. I have the beard now, my glasses are different, my hair, I'm taller, I don't know. A lot of stuff, uh, you know, but uh, it's a whole thing. You know, now that we got the introduction out of the way, uh, let's get into this, you know? Uh, I feel like there's been a lot of talk in the past couple weeks of how great my dad was, but uh, so many of you already know that, you know? You, uh, you all know him, except for maybe the few here who are crashing his funeral. Anyone here crashing his funeral? It's totally fine. I'm not judging at all. That's what my dad would do for fun. He would go to random people's funerals that he just didn't know about. Just, I don't know why, you know? So it's good to see that tradition alive and well if you are, so... Uh, like, the only reason he isn't here is because, you know, it's, uh, it's his funeral. Um, but uh, there is something that a lot of you might not know, which is that uh, Evan Shu, despite all his numerous accomplishments, was an absolutely terrible cook. Yeah, my, my mind keeps thinking about this, this lasagna he made over winter vacation when I was back, where in addition to the usual sauces and cheeses and pasta, my dad threw in olives and artichoke hearts and beans and, for some godforsaken reason, Brussels sprouts. Like, I have, I have no idea why he did that. It's crazy. He would make these curries or stir fries and literally just throw in everything he found in the fridge. I don't even think he took the time to smell it to see if it was good. You know, he'd mix sauces that didn't line up. And I swear, mom Mom doesn't fully remember this, but I swear, whenever he made quiches, he would put coffee creamer in it. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's insane, really, that a man with so many advanced degrees had so little sense of what tasted good, you know? But uh, my dad didn't like recipes, you know? He, did, he didn't follow orders, you know? He, he liked to figure things out for himself, you know? He, he was the exact same way with music. Uh, besides trying to play the trombone in the eighth grade, he never really had any formal musical training, but that didn't stop him, you know? He, he got those thick fake books that are just filled with chords and just sat down and memorized all the chords he could. He bought all those DVDs that you see sometimes that's like Donald Fagan from Steely Dan teaches jazz piano part three, you know? He had the entire series, you know, and he would watch them, you know? Um, and it really makes sense that dad loved jazz music, you know, because in jazz, you don't really make mistakes, you know? If you hit an incorrect note, all you have to do is kind of lean into it, and then suddenly it just becomes part of the song. And if that isn't dad in a nutshell, I don't know what is, you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, slowly, with a lot of practice and a lot of time, he, he figured out how to play all sorts of songs. Uh, there's so many mornings I remember being upstairs in my room, which was on the third floor of the house, and he'd be playing the piano down on the first floor of the house, you know? And he'd always be playing, like, uh, the theme song from Monk, or the theme song from Taxi, or the theme song from Hill Street Blues. For some godforsaken reason, Dad loved playing jazzy television theme songs from the 90s and early 2000s. Again, don't know why. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, there's the love of my dad's life. We're, of course, talking about his 2013 Prius plug-in. You know, when a lot of people have their, their midlife crisis, they usually go out and buy like a, a, a nice fancy sports car, like a Ferrari or something, but, but not my dad. He went for the Prius. He went for efficiency, you know, uh, and it didn't stop there, not even close, you know. He was the first in our neighborhood to get solar panels put on our house, and I remember how excited he was when he realized that having solar panels on his house and an electric car meant that he was powering his car for free. That was really fun. Like, to him, that was the coolest thing. I remember, it's like he found a loophole in the system and he was conning something, you know? Uh, yeah, you know, um, 
And he always was the first to get the new gadget, whether it's one of those camera doorbells that you put outside so that you can see who's outside, you know, or one of those uh, find your phone like squares that he taped to our cat's collar so that we couldn't lose it, you know. <laughs> Dad was always the early adopter. I think he was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, uh, you would always know dad would be at a public event because he'd be standing in the front row with his iPad just taking pictures, least conspicuously as possible. He took it everywhere. It's like Linus's security blanket, you know. He, I don't think he ever didn't have it with him, you know. Um, our home uh, has both an Alexa in the living room and a Google Home in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> It's fun, you know, sometimes Alexa wouldn't give him the answer he'd want, so he'd get a second opinion from the Google Home. <laughs> you know, sometimes we'd have him duel to see who'd get better answers, you know. You know, it's a, it, it sounds fun now, but trust me, it gets very old very quickly. <laughs> you know, um, it does kind of sound like I'm punching down on a man at his funeral, but you know, to Dad, none of this would be an insult, you know. He would embrace it. Uh, for days on end, my dad's favorite shirt to wear would be this, uh, this maroon, like, nurse's scrub shirt that he purchased from, wait for it, Staples. <laughs> That's right. Dad's favorite item clothing was purchased from an office supply store, you know? I don't even think nurses get their scrubs from Staples, you know? So why does he get it, you know? He's literally the only person I've ever seen do that. I don't know. This is a, a particular beef. I'm vamping. Anyway. Uh, but, you know, um, he had like three of them. Anyway, um, and in the same way that Indiana Jones had his iconic fedora, Dad would always be wearing both a Patriots cap and a headband around under the Patriots cap. His hair would be a mess all the time. Like, even Albert Einstein would tell him that he needed a comb, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know? But, uh... It wouldn't let him bog him down, you know? All of us in the family, we would bring this up constantly to him. We'd make fun of him for it. But, you know, he'd just wave it off because he was comfortable with it. It didn't matter. He knew what he looked like. Dad knew exactly the kind of person that he was, and he didn't let anything get to him. You know, he's so self-assured, even when he looked like a complete weirdo, you know? And I go to art school, so this is really saying something, you know? <laughs> you know... I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Uh, my dad and I, we, we didn't have a perfect relationship. No one has a perfect relationship with their dad, you know. It's a, we'd far, uh, argue a lot, um, you know, over stupid small things, you know, teenage boy stuff. But um, by the end there, it, it really did feel like we started to have a rhythm, you know. Um, some fathers and sons, they go fishing. Uh, my dad and I, we would go to the movies. That would be our thing. He'd just go casually out of the blue, want to go see bombshell and then me a film lover who also has no money would agree and off we'd go and for two hours we'd sit in that dark room just kind of not arguing being in each other's presence enjoying something together you know dad took me to so many movies in hindsight that he really should not have <laughs> like i have a very distinct memory of him showing me like terminator or the matrix and us getting to a sex scene and it just being really awkward you know i was like eight years old <laughs> i have this memory of when i was like 12 years old my sister had a sleepover so my dad asked me what movie i wanted to see and i, I had just read in the boston globe a really good review for the uh, the paul thomas anderson film the master and my dad, not knowing that much about it, agreed to take me. And I think it was around the point in the movie where Joaquin Phoenix makes a woman out of sand and begins to have sex with it that he realized he made a huge mistake. <laughs> I don't know. I liked the movie. <laughs> he thought it was boring, but I liked the movie, you know? Uh, yeah, there was another time. It was, it was December, and it was a heavy, heavy snowstorm. But I had just gotten these very exclusive advanced screening passes to uh, Inside Lewin Davis the Coen Brothers film, and I was so excited to see it, but it was just pouring snow outside. So my dad and I made an agreement. If I helped him shovel out the car, he would uh, take me to the movie. So out in the blizzard of New England, we were shoveling the snow, you know, trying to get the car, and, and we did it. We drove to the T station, we went in, we saw the movie, he thought it was boring again, I liked it, I don't know. Uh, but we, here's what happened. Uh, when we took the T back, a snowplow had driven through and buried our car in. 
right at the tea station. So here's us at 11 p.m., not with a shovel, improvising with our hands, digging out our car so we can go home for a movie that my dad did not enjoy. If that isn't love, I don't know what is, you know? Where am I? My love of movies, if you haven't gotten a sense, comes right from my dad. I remember him telling me of all these stories of when he'd be in college, and all his friends would be so busy studying on like a weekend, but not him. He'd be off at the movies, just hanging fun, not working, you know? <laughs> yeah, in the same way that like my room is just like a hoarding collection of DVDs, my dad was the exact same way with VHS tapes back in the day, you know? Um, we both liked this one particular German film we talked about. It's called uh, Wings of Desire, or uh, Der Himmel über Berlin, if you want to sound really pretentious at dinner parties. You know, um, the plot of the movie is uh, Bruno Ganz plays an angel who lives in West Berlin, and his whole job is just to watch over people and observe their lives. You know, he can't interact with them, he can't do any presence, he just observes and is there for them, you know? Um, but the thing is, Bruno falls in love with a trapeze artist, so he decides that he wants to pass over from being an angel and chooses to become a human so he can be with that person. And I keep thinking about how this, like, stoic angel life would just drive my dad insane, you know? I don't think there was a way my dad could keep quiet ever, you know? He's the type of person who wants to get his hands dirty, he wants to get involved, you know? He can't not participate, you know? It, it has to happen. He's a person who, who needed to do that, and it's just so emblematic of who he is, and it, it shows in all of us. It rubbed off on all of us, you know? Um, no son really wants to be exactly like their dad, you know? But uh, the influence my dad's had on me is, is really undeniable, you know? I remember over this break, my mom and I uh, went shoe shopping, and on the way there, I suggested we uh, stopped at the Dollar Tree so that I could buy headphones. And what was planned to be a five-minute quick stop to the Dollar Tree quickly grew into a 20-minute trip to the Dollar Tree, and I left with, like, a mountain of stuff, you know? That's just classic Evan, you know? If, if, if you thought he came here to Old South Church a lot, he went to Dollar Tree way more, you know? <laughs> you know, he loved the Dollar Tree so much. I think it's just because he could get so many cheap things, you know? He loved a good deal. <laughs> you know, I remember mom was telling me that Google Home, uh, or the camera that I mentioned earlier, my mom hates that, you know? But she asked him, why did you buy this? I don't want it. And his reply was just, it was tax-free weekend. It'd be a waste if I didn't buy anything. You know? <sighs> you know? Like, dad loved a good deal. And dad loved a good cheap thing. Because I think, in a way, if a cheap thing breaks, it's so easy to replace, you know? If a headphone stops working, there's 50 more where that came from, and you can get them for pennies on the dollar, you know? It's, it, it just shows how resourceful of a person he was, you know? Uh, there's this quote uh, from John Irving's A Prayer for Owen Meany, a book that I have not read, but took the time to Google for you guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, he wrote... Um, when someone you love dies, and you're not expecting it, you don't lose them all at once. You lose them in pieces over a long time. The way the mail stops coming, and their scent fades from the pillows, and even from their clothes in their closet and drawers. Gradually, you accumulate the parts of them that are gone, just when the day comes, when there's a particular missing part that overwhelms you with the feeling that they're gone forever, then comes another day and another specifically missing part. You know, I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, all, all the tiny things that dad would do. Uh, dad volunteered for the mail service, you know, so he actually told UPS or USPS whenever he got letters in the mail, you know, that was his job, he was like a government appointed official. Uh, so that mail thing kind of rings true, you know. But, you know, there, there's so many of these, these little things that I, I keep thinking about, and I keep thinking of, of Evan, you know? Uh, like, uh, I saw that Star Trek Picard was coming up this week, and my first instinct when I saw that news was, I wonder what Dad thinks about it. And then my second thought was, I can't talk to him about it, you know? 
I'll, I'll never be able to talk to him about it. There, there's going to be so many films and television shows and music and plays and things that I will want to discuss with my dad, but just can't because he's not there anymore. And keep in mind, right now is smack dab in the middle of Oscar season, so I really want to talk about movies right now, you know? Like, we had plans to go see 1917 on Saturday. Like, this, this is like what we talked about, you know? But it's, it's only gonna keep piling on, you know? I don't know if you knew Evan a crazy amount, but he also loved politics by the end. He would watch Rachel Maddow every day of the week, you know? And he'll never know who the 2020 Democratic candidate is. He'll never know who the president's gonna be. And it's just, it's just going to keep piling up. And it's going to keep piling up, you know? I also keep thinking about the, the five stages of grief, you know, the, uh, was it Elizabeth Kubler-Ross mom? Yeah, she nodded. Yeah, I know a lot of you can't see that. She nodded. Um, yeah, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about the five stages of grief, you know, anger, denial, acceptance, all those stuff. You can Google it. Um, but the one that I, I really can't wrap my mind around is bargaining. Like, I, 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 for the life of me, I cannot figure out who I'm supposed to be bargaining with here, you know? Like, do I cut a deal where, like, if I get better grades, God's gonna bring my dad back, you know? Like, like, like they did with Will and Grace? That was a joke I wrote in there. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing to bargain for, because there's nothing to be done, you know? It, it's happened, you know? Nothing can be done to undo this. And, you know, you just kind of have to live on it. But, you know, that... That doesn't mean he's still not gonna live on, you know? Um, his memory's gonna be there as long as I still have brain activity. I'll continue to do the things he loved. You bet I'm gonna keep watching movies, you know? Uh, we all will, you know? Life goes on and... Um, last page, don't worry. Um, even though Evan Shu may not be a part of it, his impact's never going to go away. He'll continue to exist in all of our memories of him and all of the tiny things that make us think of Evan and in that way, his impact will never go away, like, kind of, like a couch cushion that's been sat in so long that the indentation just remains, you know? Which is also what he did with his favorite chair in the living room, you know? You know? In a way, it's like Dad's never gonna be gone at all, you know? That's the end. I don't really have a formal ending. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That's not mine. This is really awkward, you guys. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the, for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. We dare to boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Thanks be to God. Hope 
is the thing with feathers by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. To celebrate Ev's childhood, Geraldine, his sister, and I have put together a special edition of Shoe News. It features the special qualities of Ev that we have all come to admire and cherish today. The first quality, happy. Did you ever see Ev without a smile? He was a happy baby, always smiling and laughing. Curious. Curiosity became evident when Ev was about two and a half. His mom was an old school doctor who made house calls. However, one time Ev and Geraldine had to come along, but they were left in the car. Now, in those days, the car was like a babysitter, considered safe and secure. However, Ev's curiosity about driving must have gotten the best of him because somehow the parking brake was released and the car started rolling down the hill. 
Fortunately, a high school football player was walking by when he saw the car with two little kids screaming inside. He ran to the car, opened the door, and stepped on the brake. The car traveled two blocks. Heroism was reported in the newspaper. Ev was published at a very early age. And, <laughs> and Auntie Ruby never used the car sitter again. <laughs> Musical. In the fourth grade, when kids started, or eighth grade, when the kids started learning to play musical instruments, Ev chose the trombone. However, there was a technical problem. His arms were too short to play, to pull on the slide, so he had to pull back and forth with a rope attached to it. <laughs> his singing career was also launched when he was young. Ev and his sisters loved to sing in the car, songs they learned in Sunday school, Christmas carols, patriotic songs, and songs on the radio. One singing game involved tunnels. They would continue singing what was playing on the radio when they went through a tunnel to see if they were still in sync when they came out of the tunnel. Sports enthusiast. To say that Ev was keen on sports is not a hyperbole. That obsession began when our Auntie Bessie took Ev and me to our first University of Washington Husky football game. We were hooked and watched games every Saturday afternoon. Go Pats! During the summer, Ev and I would bring our mitts to the Seattle Rainier baseball games, chase after foul balls, and roam the bleachers for home runs. Back then, Seattle was a farm team for the Red Sox, and we watched Jim Lonborg and Rico Petroselli play. Go Sox. <laughs> gamer. Did you ever wonder how Ev became an inveterate gamer? At any family gatherings, both the adults and kids would play games together, such as musical, musical chairs, trivial pursuit, uh, balloon popping relays. It would get quite competitive, but Ev held his own. This is late, later, this is how we introduced and evaluated our future spouses to our crazy family. Anna Marie knows this because not playing was never, a, was never an option. Ev had a way of making boring stuff fun, even math. When I slept over, Ev and I would stay up late into the night and play a math game. One would add, subtract, multiply, and divide a string of numbers out loud, while the other calculated the, the answer on the go. Ev always won. Auntie Ruby would have to tell us to go to sleep. And then there was Shoes Clue. When they were teenagers, Ev, G, and Karen made their own board game called Shoes Clue. Based on rooms of their house, themselves and others as suspects, and potential weapons found around the house. Whenever we or anybody went over there, we all wanted to play Shoes Clues. Art. Of course, like all Asians, Ev was good in math and science, and being the son of two doctors, he was born with an MD in his future. But in high school, he took a commercial art class where the teacher played jazz while the students carried on their assignments. This awakened Ev's artistic side and inspired him to pursue architecture. Adventure. At his high school graduation, the drama students performed the song Aquarius. Many students jumped out of their chairs to join in. Ev wanted to, but couldn't. He was still too quiet and bookish. Clearly, he wanted to break out of the Asian male stereotype. We'll hear from Roger and John how Ev left Seattle and family for the adventure of Stanford, where he pursued this goal and became who we all now know. Finally, the value of family. Ev was born into a very large extended family, numbering more than 100. The Shu side was huge, but they all lived in Taiwan and China. And China. The Inoue side was equally large, but concentrated in Seattle. Family was, and still is, very central to our lives. We celebrated every holiday and every birthday together at least until the family got too big to fit into the homes. But as we grew up with Ev and he with us, he blessed us with his special qualities. So, in closing this edition of Shoe News, the family wishes to say, Ev, thank you.
We'll miss you. phone, so I'll use my paper. So I'm honored to speak today about Evan, and I'm especially honored to do so here at Old South Church, a sacred place that was central to Evan's life and identity for decades. Evan and I became friends while studying architecture at Stanford. My earliest memories of him are from sitting together in architectural history classes. Evan would quietly make amusing observations about various things and students, often with a little chuckle. Not infrequently, his observations were about quirks of mine and deserved the chuckle, and sometimes he'd target himself. Senior year, we picked drawing tables next to each other in the far corner of the architecture building. This destined us to spend many hours, perhaps hundreds, in close proximity. It was a good choice for me. As my wife Barb observes, Evan was a notably calm person. And calm is good when you're working endless hours and are hopelessly behind. Of course, that was my situation, not Evan's. He was always on top of things and clearly the strongest student among us. At those tables, we had many hours of conversation. Those conversations drifted over topics in a casual, semi-philosophical manner. Should Mary have told Lou Grant about Murray's secret problem? <laughs> and how would the Shaolin principles of peace and tolerance be sidestepped in the coming episode of Kung Fu, thereby allowing the fight scene that most viewers tuned in for. We also had many hours of quiet as we worked. Evan was a particularly good person to be with during quiet times, in part because he was so comfortable being quiet. Actually, though, in those days, Evan's calm exterior hid a highly competitive interior. Unlike most of us mortals, Evan finished four years at Stanford in just three, and often would make comments about acing out the other students. That mostly hidden competitive nature was so strong that years later, Evan made a point of telling me that he had moved beyond it. I remembered a conversation because Evan felt he had reached a milestone of sorts by leaving behind certain ambitions. During college, I called Evan Mies. This is because Evan's drawings had the simplicity, elegance, and beauty I associated with the work of Mies van der Rohe, the German architect who famously said, less is more. So I called Evan Mies. In turn, he called me John. Because that's my name, and Evan wasn't into embellishing things. <laughs> After graduation, Evan moved east for grad school, and then he stayed. He told me once he loved all the things about Boston that other people hated, especially the crazy drivers and the bad weather. <laughs> I, remember Evan, I remember visiting Evan when he was living in a tiny, back bay studio apartment. His primary, perhaps only, decoration was an unframed poster that quoted a Chinese philosopher. It said, he who gathers has little, he who scatters has much. He who gathers has little spoke to Evan's indifference to material goods. Over the decades I knew Evan, the only time I saw him excited about a thing, this has already been told by Nate, but was in fact his plug-in Prius. 
about which he was very excited. Memorably, during one of my early Boston visits, Evan told me he had reached the state of being rich. Given the size of his apartment and his lack of possessions, this seemed like a surprising conclusion. But Evan's explanation made complete sense and left a lasting impression. He said, I'm rich because if there's anything I want, I know there's enough money in my checking account to buy it. So I don't even note the checks I write anymore. There's no need to track them. Of course, Evan's sense of being rich wasn't about whether or not he tracked his checking account. It was about realizing that he had enough, and he didn't need or want more. It's a lesson which has affected my sense of money and possessions ever since. The second half of the saying, he, he who scatters has much, is also relevant. It described Evan's desire to share what he had with others, most notably his time, his knowledge, friendship, and kindness. It's likely we are all here today because of the valuable things Evan scattered our way. Over the years, I had many opportunities to return to Cambridge and Boston, and almost always on these trips, Evan and I would get together for meals and conversation. Regardless of whether they were with us, Anna Marie, Amanda, and Nate were always part of the discussion. Family was consistently front and center for Evan. Nothing showed this more than the shoe news, the holiday greeting most awaited each year at our house. From it, Barb and I learned the latest on Anna Marie's work helping others, on Amanda's poetry and Nate's stand-up comedy career, and many other aspects of the shoe family's life. Evan proudly reported all of it. Last October, Evan returned to Stanford for our 45th reunion. As we sat together in an auditorium for the class panel discussion, Evan started quietly making observations about various classmates and their statements, accompanied with little chuckles. I reflexively joined right in, and it was as, as if nothing had changed in the years since we sat in a nearby classroom doing the same thing. Later that weekend, Evan, Leo, and I had a pleasant dinner with a wide-ranging conversation. After Leo dropped us off at my house for the night, Evan and I enthusiastically watched two episodes of Kung Fu, the show that inspired so many quasi-philosophical discussions back in the architecture building. Amazingly, Evan could recall much of the dialogue uh, verbatim from shows he hadn't seen for 50 years. The next day, before going to the airport, Evan and I wandered around the Googleplex, and then we drove past the Frank Geary buildings at Facebook. It was a great morning, but I worried about Evan's cough and the frequent use of his nebulizer. That said, I never would have guessed that we would all be here today talking about Evan's in the past tense. My friend Evan embodied what's important to me in Mies van der Rohe's observation that less is more. Evan was quiet, and I always found his quiet to be more valuable and reassuring than other people's noisier approach to life. Evan was comfortable with who he was and what he had, and he always made me feel more comfortable with who I am and what I have. And Evan found the world to be full of things worthy of amusing observation and chuckles. And as a result, he probably helped all of us avoid taking ourselves too seriously. Of course, less is not always more. Sometimes less is, in fact, less. All of us know that today. As we remember Evan, we know that he should have had many more years. In this case, less is most painfully less for Anna Marie, Amanda, and Nate. But I hope they take comfort, as I do, in knowing how many people loved Evan 
and have had richer lives because of him. So um, I'm Roger, and I uh, first met Evan um, when he was a freshman at Stanford University. So at that time, for the first time in Stanford's history, they developed a, a Asian theme dorm, and Evan had applied for that and actually was in that dormitory. Now I thought he was just like all those other pre-med students, where there were over 40 percent declared uh, medical for their um, major because he was taking biology and mathematics classes just like every other pre-med. So uh, you were right, Nate, about him seeing all these um, uh, movies at Stanford. Because at that time, Stanford also set up a bargain basement uh, first-run movie program every Sunday, which cost 25 cents, I believe, or something like that. And he would troll around the hallways on Sunday night saying, who wants to go to the Sunday night flicks with me? And of course, he got no takers. And uh, these were all pre-meds, of course, who were studying because the next Monday, the next day, of course, there was a quiz or a midterm or a final for one of these required courses for the pre-meds. And um, Evan went to all those movies. And of course, like was mentioned by Poco, he aced, or I guess John, he aced all of these classes. Um, and so, uh, that was one thing that was interesting because I didn't know. I thought he was a pre-med, and he wasn't. He wasn't actually so an architecture student. So what was amazing is that he did the pre-med protocol and the architecture at the same time and still got all A's. Um, now, the other things that happened uh, during Stanford those early days is that dormitory, for whatever reason, the Asian-themed dorm, produced their own play of Little Abner. And um, yeah, again, yeah, whatever. But uh, with Little Abner, it was kind of very interesting because we noticed the people that were involved in the play, um, the director chose the correct student for each character because we noticed, do you know, when you look at the character that's um, being presented, the personality of that student seemed to exactly match that character. And so I don't know if anybody knew what Evan's character was, but it was... Um, Mayor Daniel, dog meat. And Mayor Dog Meat, uh, I read the uh, official um, description of his character, and it says he's officious, he's a hillbilly, he's a yokel, but most of all, he's friendly. Um, I'm not going to tell you what my character was, but that's another story. Uh, now, the other thing that we did um, as far as music is concerned is we actually did a uh, presentation of, everybody knows the song Benny and the Jets from Elton John. Well, the students decided from that dormitory, we're going to put on a performance of Benny and the Jets. And uh, one of the uh, students' name was Ben, so he was Benny, but we chose three other students to be the Jets. Myself, uh, Mike Liu, uh, who's here, I think, as well as Evan. And Evan really got into this. I mean, he got the hat and the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the um, dress up with all the sh fringes on it and everything like that you did in the 70s. Uh, and I think actually one of the other students has brought some pictures of these for you, Anne Marie. So if you want to take a look at them, I think they'll be available. Oh, they're in a slideshow. Wonderful. So you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, now, the other thing is that Evan and I. Once we graduated from Stanford, we were the two people to come east, from west coast to east coast, and we both went to Boston. He went to the architecture school at Harvard, and I went to Tufts Medical School. Now, at Tufts Medical School, we actually had a small group of students who were not used to the east coast, and we kind of bonded together and um, supported each other. So during spare uh, moments, like during our breaks, we would actually take excursions, or we'd have dinners at somebody's apartment, or uh, meet at some activity at a restaurant. And I said, you know what? Um, Evan would fit nicely with our group. 
And the reason I did that also is that Evan um, actually reached out to me during our first uh, month at, uh, at Boston. And uh, Harvard at that time, I guess, had their own ice skating rink. And he would invite me over every week to go ice skating. So he had never ice skated before, of course. We're from the West Coast. And I had never ice skated. But he convinced me to come over every week and do ice skating with him. And of course, we did it so much that I had to buy my own pair of ice skates. So I have that now still, actually, from then. Um, so I invited Evan over, actually, to join our group. And lo and behold, he fit right in. He became one of the honorary members of this Tufts Medical Student Group. And so he came on all these activities with us. He would go to the excursions up out of Boston, by the way. We'd go to Maine. We'd go to other uh, dinners. We'd do uh, all these activities. And he made such an impression on all of these tough students that they became lifelong friends. And I think you'll see that, that they're actually scattered among the crowd here today. They've come from essentially all over the, all over the country to come and uh, remember Evan. Um, now, what's interesting about Evan is he influenced me personally also. Because besides the ice skating, he had the grand idea that we're going to run the Boston Marathon. And so he convinced me to start training. And every weekend, we go on these 16, 18-mile runs, which was quite a long distance. Um, and lo and behold, we were able to complete that first marathon back then. Uh, and then he convinced me again to come out two years later to run another one. But what I found out from Anna Marie's uh, notes is that he had actually ended up running eight of these. I mean, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. So that shows you how uh, tough a guy he was and what character he had and you know, his drive. Um, now, once uh, we left, or I left Boston, I should say, uh, and came out to the West Coast, Evan kept in contact with all of his friends from Stanford and Tufts that lived in Southern California. So he'd come out periodically, and you could see his love for life because he said, on my next visit, we're going to go roller skating by the beach in Venice. And so that's what we did. And then another time it was, well, I think we should go to Las Vegas or one of these other places. But what he did to me one time, he said, last second, you know what? Why don't we hop on this bus that leaves at midnight, goes to Vegas, you gamble all night, and it brings you back. And so I was actually a medical resident. So... For me, that was quite a trip because I didn't have a lot of time, but I tell you, we had the greatest experience. Uh, we talked going in the bus and coming back, and um, uh, Evan, like I said, had this way of convincing you that this was the right thing to do, and it turned out he was correct. Um, now, in the um, mid-'80s, I actually met my life partner, and I said to Evan, Hey, Evan, can you do me a favor? could you come out and be my best man? And without hesitation, he said, sure, I'll do that. So he came out to the West Coast, and he helped me organize my side with the groomsmen and everything like that, so I didn't have to worry about it. And it ran very smoothly. And it's a lucky it did, because my wife is very picky about these kind of things. So if something went wrong, I would have heard about it. Um, and by the way, if, I don't know if we have pictures of it also, Evan looked great in that tuxedo. Um, when Anna Marie and Evan decided to uh, marry in Seattle, uh, they had to be very meticulous about the invitee list because they had such a large family. So a few of us did not get the formal invitation to come to the wedding. And uh, what we thought is Evan is not going to get away with this. And uh, with the help of Poco and his parents as well, because um, both of the parents came along with this, we staged a mock wedding for Anna Marie and Evan. And so when they entered the, um, unbeknownst to them, when they entered the um, facility, uh, we gave them the um, wedding processional, bridal wedding processional with the kazoos playing. We had a nice bridal veil for Anna Marie to wear. And of course, we had the tuxedo for Evan that was painted on a t-shirt. Um, we actually had a number of speeches, which turned out to be a roast for Evan, of course. Uh, we had a very sumptuous dinner. We had um, 
um, a nice uh, gathering with a conversation, and I think it was a very memorable event for every one of those people that came. Um, later on, we actually made some visits back to Boston, and one of them, uh, I guess it was kind of a mistake. We had a two-year-old daughter that we took a cross-country plane trip with, and then the next day we said, oh, let's go to Maine to go blueberry picking because our daughter will enjoy that. So Evan and Anna Marie, of course, volunteered to drive us in their small Honda Prelude. Well, unbeknownst to us, our daughter had a, a, pre, a, a problem with car sickness. And I do not want to tell you the details of this, but it was not pretty. And this was very memorable for both Evan and Anna Marie because to this day, like last year when Evan came to the um, 45th reunion for Stanford class, we were walking uh, along the campus to, to one of the events and he just says, he brought it up and said, do you remember that time when we drove up to Maine? And he goes, it's very clear in my mind right now. Um, so, uh, and Anna Marie actually mentioned that just recently as well. Um, now, Sorry. Uh, Nate was actually correct also about um, Evan and his musical um, career, I guess. Uh, he actually would come to our house on some visits, and he would sit down at the piano and just spontaneously start playing one of these theme songs from one of the uh, shows. And then when I asked him, because there was no music there, he said, oh, yeah, I just play it by ear. And so he taught himself how to do this. I mean, it's very impressive, I thought. Um, now, there was another time when we actually uh, hosted a, I guess, visit when Nate came, uh, along with Evan, to visit the colleges. And he came to our house and said, oh, could you actually maybe invite a few friends that he hadn't seen for a little while from the Southern California area? So we send out an invite, and lo and behold, several dozen uh, responses later, we had this large crowd in our backyard. We had to get a tent and set it up so that everybody would be covered from the sun. And on top of that, we started having participants coming, driving from Northern California, and even flying in from Northern California to attend this for Evan. Um, so I think that kind of demonstrates the kind of effect he had on all of his acquaintances that he did make these uh, lifelong friends. So the drop of the hat, they just said, sure, we'll be there. Um, I think all of us will truly miss Evan, but we are all thankful for his friendship, his kindness, his enthusiasm for life, and especially for me, the life lessons that he taught us all. Thank you.
I was asked to represent the architectural and professional aspect of Evan's life. Evan was, by profession, an architect, a designer of the built environment. But that was truly only a part of who he was. Evan was also a teacher, mentor, entrepreneur, and author. I believe, however, his most meaningful legacy will be not as an architect of structures, but as an architect of community. Some 30 plus years ago, architecture and design were making the transition from paper and pencil to CAD, computer-aided design and drafting. It was expensive stuff and a real challenge for many of us to figure out how to use. Our minds and hands had been conditioned to move in unison as easily as we drew each breath. Computers were finicky. Software was a relatively new word. We thought maybe it referred to socks and required us to learn how to do things the way the computer demanded, lest nothing useful would become of it. A program called DataCAD came along. It was created by architects for architects. It was easy to learn and understand. It was cool stuff. But we all still needed a lot of help figuring out the best way to make it do what we wanted it to do. There was a much more complicated timeline for what came next, but let's just say, along came Evan Shu. Evan helped create a monthly newsletter called Cheap Tricks. The word cheap came from Evan's desire to find elegant, free, or affordable methods to help us work smarter instead of harder. For a long time, it was printed on paper and snail mailed all over the country, and even to other countries. Eventually, it went digital and became truly global. People began to develop sub-programs to work within DataCAD, so Evan, created a mail order store for their distribution called Cheap Tricks Wear. To this day, it still exists, though it too has moved from floppy disks to CDs to online. Evan was always exuberantly embracing the changing times, never fighting them. Evan was also instrumental in creating and growing the DataCAD Boston user group, known to us as Debug, which met at the offices of different architects each month for decades. Through Evan's tenacity and love of people, connections and community, to this day, it still exists. And over the years, Evan coordinated and attended nearly every one. He loved the people and the camaraderie, the community. There is more history involving Evan that I could share, but I think you have the idea. Let's just say that Evan brought together a lot of people. It was always about the people. And these communities of people have endured, and these communities of people respected and loved Evan for all he was and all he did. I first met Evan at a debug meeting, though I don't remember which one. It was a long time ago and not the sort of thing you commit to memory, not knowing how dearly you would wish you had for such a time as this. Because Evan touched so many people, even without having met them, I knew the best way to do justice to his memory was to reach out to those communities of architects, data catters, and debuggers to ask what Evan meant to them. I received dozens of emails with many stories, remembrances, and thank yous. They spanned from coast to coast in the US and as far away as Brazil, Europe, Israel, and Australia. Each was personal and different, but in their praise, they were also remarkably similar. A gentleman, a gentle soul, kind, generous, mentor, helpful perhaps to a fault, thoughtful, humble. For many of us, the most important description was friend. I'll be sure to compile these and other remembrances to give to Anna Marie, Nate, and Amanda. Short in stature, Evan may have often been the shortest man in the room, but he was never ever the smallest. With his smile and his presence, he will be remembered as a very big man by, thousands, by the thousands of people he touched. And by them, by us, he will be dearly remembered as an architect of community. Evan was a Christian and a faithful member of this church. I too am a Christian, and the good news and the gift of the Christian faith is that we can live with the pain of loss and the hope of the resurrection at the same time. They don't cancel each other out. 
They are both real and ours, especially at a time like this. So what brings me comfort, what I pray will give us all comfort now, is that hope, the hope of the resurrection. Amen. first asked me to say a few words, I said to myself, I, I just don't know if I can do it. My dearest friend is gone. Then I recalled an incident that took place many years ago in California when Evan and I were partners, architectural partners. I can still remember it vividly. Evan wanted to go parachuting with two of my brothers. I stayed on the ground. They all got on a plane. My two brothers jumped first, everything went fine. Well, Evan jumped and his parachute did not open. It started getting tangled. So sooner or later, they were both spinning down to the ground. We were all catching our breath saying, what's gonna happen? Well, after a few moments, the second parachute opened and about 200 feet from the ground, he was able to land safely at the very last minute. We all ran towards him and gave him a big hug. When we went back to the office that afternoon, Evan opens the door wide and says, okay, everybody, let's go to lunch, my treat. That evening, Evan confessed to me that the night before, he had been contemplating, what if the parachute doesn't open? Would I have the courage to be able to take the steps to get to the ground the way I, they taught me? I would have to tear the first parachute with the knife, get rid of that, and pull the second one. Could I do it? You know, I'd really like to know if I do have that courage. Maybe it will happen. I was just shocked by that kind of statement. But that was Evan. Well, as we all, as we all know, Evan has lots of courage in many aspects of his life. We worked together in an architectural project in school and professionally. In our last semester at Harvard, we worked together as a team on a very large project. That's why it required a team. Well, typical Evan style, he wanted to do more than what was required. So we had to do the drawings, the diagrams, the reports, and he didn't want to build just one model, he wanted to build two models. As he was telling me this, I just gulped and said, how the heck are we gonna get this all done? Well. To get to the final presentation, we had to stay up four days and three nights. And luckily, Evan kept me awake most of the time. But during our final presentation to the, to the professors, he fell asleep during his time. So I had to step in and do his part. Afterwards, I was feeling really bad saying, oh boy, he must. But I go in and see Evan, and he just said, Leo, we did it. And that was Evan, even though he fell asleep. He was just glad that we made what he had set out to do. We met our goal. I had met her, I admired his courage to challenge, to challenge himself, regardless of what others thought. Yeah. Many of you know that Evan had a pretty good sense of humor. Well, our first semester at Harvard, we had our first vacation. We decided to go to Canada. So Evan rented a car. We went to Quebec, Montreal. And with a sense of adventure, he parked anywhere he wanted to park. Well, sure enough, we ended up getting four tickets, parking tickets. And our way back, I was really, really concerned, thinking, how are we gonna get, take care of this? We're gonna be reaching the border pretty soon and they're gonna stop us there. So I said, Evan, how are we gonna take care of this? When are we gonna take care of this? So he looks at me straight in the eye, grabs the tickets off the dashboards, tears them in half and throws them out the window. <laughs> and I just was in shock. 
Think of heaven. And he goes, Leo, he says, just think about it. Think about it carefully. Do you think the authorities are going to waste their time on four tick parking tickets in another country? Don't worry about it. Well, to this day, I still look over my shoulder, but I took his words. <laughs> I met Evan our first day at Harvard. His office, I mean, his, his room was across from mine. And um, we started realizing that we had both been to Stanford together. Even though I did not know him at Stanford, we realized we knew a lot of the same people and the same curriculum. Well, we started talking about ideas, about sports, sharing our beliefs. That was the main thing that really, I think, got us together. And our friendship developed from there, where we ended up meeting many challenges professionally, academically, and sports, and personally. I learned a lot from Evan. I learned a lot from Evan's character, his intellect, and his generosity. In particular, I learned his courage to be himself, to be authentic. I will miss him dearly, as you know many of you will too. And we'll always see his memory as a blessing. And in particular, a beacon of courage. Death is a mystery that beats at the heart of our shared being. None of us shall escape it. But Christians believe, Evan believed, God has made a way through death, across a sea and onto a farther shore, where the saints do gather in a greater light, where the saints who have gone before, where Evan is not dead, but wondrously alive in God's transcendent love. And because of that, nothing will ever be the same again. We shall lose battles, but the war is won. We shall not escape our share of grief or fear or pain, but on the far side of the tomb, all tears shall be wiped away, and death is no more. We are in church today, not at a funeral home, not in a rented hotel room or any other venue, to make this audacious claim that though Evan died, yet does he live. This is our faith. As we say at Old South Church, this is our story and we're sticking to it. The hymn, Be Now My Vision, was one of Evan's very favorite hymns. Let us sing it together, but please remain seated.
Let us all bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, our mother, our father, from whom we come unto whom we return, indeed the divine presence securing our deepest human and spiritual foundations, grounding the wonder and mystery of our lives midst your resplendent creation, the living presence serving as the mightiest of cords and threads, binding our friendships and companionships, indeed knitting us graciously into families. We offer our profound gratitude for your loving and patient engagement with us, for your presence in Jesus who shows us your way, the one through whom we gain the meaning, lying hidden in the heart of sorrow, disappointment and grief, the one who displays most perfectly your guiding hand along the paths of our pilgrimage. We give special thanks to you this afternoon for your voracious, open-hearted servant, Evan Shu, recalling all in him that made others to love and to treasure him. We express our gratitude for all the noble and tender influences in his early home and training, for all that buttressed and encouraged the best in his life. We thank you for the humor, upbeat amiability, and imagination passing from his life into ours and into the lives of others, his neighbors, his classmates, his vocational colleagues, deeply touching his extended nationwide family and here at home, embracing in Melrose, Anna Marie, Nate, and Amanda, surely a brilliant presence making so many of us in the world richer for the vitality and vigor of his life. As we gather this afternoon, we celebrate Evan Shue's faith and hope in you, the God of the biblical faith and of Jesus Christ, a faith and hope taking root years ago in that Seattle Baptist church a faith and hope traversing this vast land and sconcing itself finally at Boston's crossroads of Dartmouth and Boylston. A faith and hope triggering his boundless capacity and eagerness for leadership in the ranks of this congregation's parliamentary order, its mission priorities and pastoral tasks wondrously revealing in these latter days an Old South historian and archivist extraordinaire. And yes, beneficent creator, we rejoice in Evan singing his faith and his hope with gusto and rollicking rhythm among the choirs joining in his honor and memory this afternoon. We recall today and recognize unique and rare intellectual gifts an openness to new and fresh information and learning, a mind roaming and interpreting the numeric and digital universe, his inherent art of fashioning the content of that trusted, adored CAD partner, his, his handy abiding laptop, fashioning its content into structural design, transmitting professional clues ingeniously to architects worldwide, justly winning him election and distinguished recognition as a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, Evan Shu, F-A-I-A. -A. Here is gracious God as we offer thanksgiving today for Evan's loving bond with and everlasting fidelity to his family. We celebrate a nearly three decade marriage to Anna Marie Ross Shu a romance kindled and stoked amid the programs within the walls of this church, inspiring a joyous Beaverton, Oregon wedding presided over by one of our lustrous and most admired and revered pastoral colleagues, 
Marcus Walker. And the cherished children of Anna Marie and Evan, two, Nate and Amanda, we happily witnessed as they grew up and matured in our church school. And we ask your blessing on them now as they pursue higher education, frame their futures, and share mutual memories, hopes, and aspirations with Anna Marie. And we remember today two precious children, Melanie Hope and Noah Bernard Evan, a miracle sister and brother born with Amanda, remaining among us much too briefly, but now welcoming their father into a dynamic and radiant quality of life, prepared ultimately by divine love for each of us and bless you for all families. We beg you, O oh merciful God, grant each member of Anna Marie and Evan's vast and devoted family the assurance of your consoling presence and confidence in your healing spirit. And we pray, surround each of us gathered here this afternoon. And yes, those of us joining in this service streamed with reverence and hope into worshiping and devout households. Surround all of us with your continuing and an unending compassion and courage. And grant we may all travel on more serenely after today, reminded of the depth and integrity of your promises. And then, gracious God, in your good time, reunite us with those we have loved in this worldly realm of your love. Yea, reunite us in your new realm, where there shall be no more tears, no more partings, through Jesus Christ, the sovereign of our life, savior of your world. Amen. To say goodbye is near. The day I hoped would never come is here. Though many hearts are broken, we must somehow carry on. Cause I think you're gonna miss me when I'm gone. I thought my life was over when we met So little to remember So much to forget Though it was you who saw me through the darkness to the dawn Still I think you're gonna miss me when I'm gone I'm a modest one and it hurts me to say these things to you after all that we've been through it's the least that I can do so instead of just goodbye I'll say so long and as for the light by which you see me, leave it on. I am better than I was before, knowing you has made me strong. And 
I sure am gonna miss you when I'm gone. Yes, I sure am gonna miss you when I'm gone. I invite you to rise as you are able in body or in spirit for the commendation. Into your hands, most merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Evan. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a son of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the company of the saints in light. And may the angels in heaven welcome you, Evan. May you find safe harbor, profound rest, and peace. And let the church say, Amen. Go from this place loving God so much that you love nothing else too much and fearing God enough that you need fear nothing else at all. I invite you to be seated for the postlude and following the service, you're invited to join Evan's family for reception in the chapel through the doors behind you. You may be seated. 